Hi everybody and welcome back to Cheatash. My name is Chris and today we're going to be going over 1984, Chapter 2, Part 9, the final part of Winston reading over Goldstein's book. And today's section that he is reading over, or the section that we are going over today, is the section he reads on ignorance is strength. If you guys remember last time, it was all about war. And war is peace. So that was the chapter that we went over previously that Winston had read. Well, we're going to jump right into it now because he is reading a whole new chapter on how I would sum it up would be the dynamics, the social dynamics, maybe, of Oceania. And war is peace was all about how and mostly why Oceania is always in this constant state of warfare, the relationship between Oceania and the other super states. If you guys remember, there nobody's winning. Nobody's attacking each other. They're all just like in a perpetual stalemate, and everything's just fought over these little tiny territories just for the slave labor, and just so the slave labor can be used to perpetuate more war and keep the masses focused on an all uh, on this total I, I was almost going to say total war but it's mentioned previously that I don't even think total war exists in this world that Winston is living in right now it used to but I don't think it exists right now in that same effect anyway guys let's hop right into it because we take a little bit of a break here before Winston jumps back into the book because Julia arrives. So Winston stops reading the chapter. Uh, Julia walks in. Apparently, they haven't seen each other for a week. And if you guys remember, Winston goes to his room that he's renting from Sherrington Shop right after this hell of a week where he's got to put in like 90 hours, something like that, or tri double, triple overtime to rectify history because they switched up who they are going to war against right in the middle of hate week so in the worst time to do that right in the middle of hate week there's banners there's speeches everybody's talking about the enemy like east asia or eurasia i forget what it was it's so confusing because they both start with e you know and and then all of a sudden halfway through hate week they have to change everything the banners the speeches they have to go back to work to rectify everything because again who they were enemies with and fighting with that's who they always were fighting so they now that they switched it they have to go back through history and change all that because again the the party is always right they're the source of absolute truth so here walks julia they haven't seen each other for a week she's a pretty tired she immediately wants to go to bed so they hop into bed and Winston still has the book on his mind he's trying to convince Julia hey you need to read this too because you were in that meeting with O'Brien and I we're all in this together you have just as much of a responsibility to read this as I do but she's tired she's falling asleep so she asks him to start reading it to her aloud and that's what he does. And he picks up going back to chapter one, which again is ignorance is strength. So he starts reading this. And here we're going to get a glimpse of, again, like I said, social dynamics. So society is broken up into these three groups. The Society of Oceania is broken up into these three groups. So there's a high, a middle, and a low. Upper class, middle class, lower class. The upper class, the high, is securely in power. This is like the inner party. They're, they're aristocrats. And they continually stay in power. And I put some question marks here because although the people change, the general idea and thought structure and mood, the general the general thoughts of the high continue on. And that's really the goal of the high. It's not by blood. It's not to pass down 
their wealth and power from to blood relations down the line. It's no, just to keep the ideas of Ingsoc going for generations and generations. This is why it's mentioned in here that the party is not racist. They want everybody and anybody to come in and just perpetuate the propaganda. So that's the upper class. Then we have the middle. The middle, what ends up happening is the middle will attempt to overthrow the high. They usually enlist the help of the low. And then once they prevail, they actually establish more tyranny when the establishment high is overthrown. So this is where th that idea of continually staying in power comes into place. You get that thirst of power. Hey, the middle just overcame, but now they're no better than the previous people they overthrew. It's like that saying, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, kind of. Next, the low. They're thrust to their old lowly position in the aftermath of the revolution, and they stay low. This is like the proles. So the middle is like the outer party, the high the inner party, the low, are the proles. And it's mentioned in Goldstein's book that no revolution has ever resulted in, in, in equality. Just the inequality just keeps perpetuating, keeps perpetuating. And it's mentioned that inequality is the price of civilization. This is what we get for civilizing into agrarian, industrial societies. You're going to have inequalities, is what Goldstein is saying. So the machine production allowed humans to no longer live at different economic levels. But we can't have that happen. So what he means by this is life has been made so easy that machines have taken over the work of humans in a lot of sectors, a lot of areas of life that... Now humans can just live on a level where they're mano a mano and they're not measuring each other by the amount of work they do, the amount of money they make, because all that has been pushed onto the machines. But Big Brother in the party says, no, we can't have that happen. No, no, no. Uh, there's, a, there's a new aristocracy filled with scientists, technicians, sociologists, teachers, journalists, that are still working towards perpetuating this inequality. And technical advancements have destroyed private life. You think about telescreens, the speak right, Big Brother's posters always watching you, kids spying on you, all of that stuff. You don't have any privacy. All that privacy... Well, no, you don't have any, really. Even out in, like, the woods where Winston and Julia met, there could still be microphones or cameras out there. That's the crazy thing. We're going to get to a little bit of a camera in the next part, actually. Um, private property has been abolished in Oceania. For at least, you know, the proles and the the outer party. Actually, I don't even know if the proles... Because the proles have a lot of freedoms. Actually, I don't know if they would have private property rights. I don't know. But the private property got concentrated in the few. The party pretty much owns everything in Oceania. And it's all under this guise of collectivism. Like, hey, we're all sharing in this thing. right? But really, it's only the few that have that control and like, hey, they let you have access to all of these things, all right? But, you know, the party has access to the best food, right? O'Brien looks, just look at how he looks. He looks better than Winston and Julia. They can't have makeup or anything like that, so they don't really look that great and they live in different parts of Oceania. Winston lives in like the Victory Mansions. O'Brien's house was like extravagant. So it's all this inequality is permanent. It's it's all by plan. 
this is how the party wants to have it. They don't want to have equality, but they want to make it seem like everybody's equal. So how can a ruling group fall from power? So there, Goldstein talks about four ways that this can happen. So you have all these inequalities. Hey, we're going to rise up. We want to change things. So we have to take and overthrow the most high. the Not the most high, but the high group, the upper class. How is, how is that done? How is that done? Well, that's done by a couple ways. I'm just flipping through the book here. I think it's here. One of the ways is conquered from without, which I think really means conquered from outside of the country. That was I wasn't too clear on this point from uh, Goldstein. The second point here, the masses revolt due to government inefficiency. Third point, a string of the middle group comes into being a strong, I'm sorry, a strong and discontented middle group comes into being. Or four, the loss of the mo the high upper class, their self-confidence and willingness to govern. All four of these are present to some degree during a revolution. But the change, the only way to change is through slow demographic changes. So over time, you get a little bit more and more people thinking like Winston, thinking that, hey, something's not right here. Something seems weird. I don't like that I have no privacy. I don't like that I can't think certain things. But you know, the unfortunate thing here is the masses never revolt on their own accord. And they never revolt merely because they are oppressed, says Goldstein. So that's kind of sad. They're never going to revolt because they're so intertwined with the state in this constant state of fear from wars, mostly wars, from maybe not having enough, that they're never going to revolt because their minds are on elsewhere, the day-to-day -day lives just to survive in Oceania. They don't have time to really think about revolting. It's like Maslow's hierarchy. It's first survival. They're just trying to survive. And that's how the party intends it to be. So then we're introduced to Big Brother. And I find it interesting. I don't really think Big Brother's real. It's, it's said in the book, nobody has actually ever seen Big Brother. You have this image of him, yes, but maybe the image is just a construct of somebody that you can visualize and always look back to as, hey, this is somebody who I can trust. Remember in the two minutes of hate, it ends with a picture of Big Brother and like kind of, it, it, it soothes the people. They're all worked up from seeing uh, Goldstein from the enemy soldiers and then all of a sudden Big Brother comes in to soothe you. But nobody's ever seen Big Brother. Big Brother is made to be infallible, all-powerful. Like I said, nobody's ever seen him. Nobody knows when he was born. And this is the other thing Goldstein mentions, he will never die. So that's what makes me think Big Brother is not real. It's, the, it's an idea. Idea that somebody, something, is watching your every move and you need to be careful with what you do or what you say. And like I said, Big Brother functions as this focal point for love, fear, and reverence. The members of Oceania love Big Brother. They see him as a father figure, a godlike figure. Hey, we, Big Brother will never do us wrong. Follow him. As long as we follow Big Brother, he'll never lead us astray. He's always right. Next, the party members. So we, like we were kind of mentioning earlier, we have the inner party. So the high. Right around 6 million people, which ends up being less than 2% of Oceania. Which is crazy that they have all this power in this, in less than 2% of Oceania. I was just talking to somebody about this 80-20 rule, if you guys have ever heard of it, that 
like 80 percent Vilfredo Perito. It's the Perito pr- principle. 80% of Italian land was owned by like around 20% of the people. So it's a, whatchamacallit, misalignment. If there's a better word for it, a skew, misalignment. So the few control the many, basically. And that's what we have here with the Interparty. They're the brains of the operation. They're doing all the propaganda. And... The inner party is very smart, but you can't have smallest deviations on opinion. So, yes, they are very smart. Doesn't mean they can think whatever they want to think, though. So, Goldstein likens the party members to parts of the body. So, he says the inner party is like the brains. Then there's the outer party, like Winston and Julia. They're the hands. They get a ton of the work done. I don't know what the proles would be. The proles would be, I guess, maybe like the feet that are just, well, no. Well, maybe they would be the feet because they're 85% of the population. So they are like the majority base. And they're never going to rebel. They're never going to rebel. I mean, just remember when Winston first goes and meets some of the proles. He goes into the bar, Sherrington shop and stuff. Just talking to the proles, does it seem like they're people that want to rebel? They can't even remember what's in the past. They talk with a different accent. They're just concerned about drinking beer. It doesn't seem like they're interested in rebelling. So I found this interesting that in order to be selected into the party, you have to like go through an interview process. So like you're not born into the inner party. So like even if you're born from inner party parents, you're not that doesn't mean that you'll be a part of the inner party so you still have to go through an examination at the age of 16 and again like i said there's no racial discrimination here anybody can be in the ranks of the party right but they don't they don't just pick anybody and case in point proles can't enter into the other groups now there are proles who are very smart strong, good head on their shoulders. The ones with potential, they're just eliminated. We can't have them. We can't have them potentially starting a revolution. And I want to read something here. Party limit is 6 million, below 2% of the population. Okay, never mind. The party is not concerned with who wields power as long as the structure remains the same. This is what I mentioned earlier. It doesn't, they're not looking to pass down their power to their children. They're looking to just pass it on to other people who are willing to perpetuate the same thought structure of Ingsoc, Doublethink, Newspeak, all of that. Well, then we come to the thought police. Where the party members live from birth to death under the eye of the thought police. Even when he is alone, he can never be sure that he is alone. And we saw the thought police, Winston, kind of be scared of them back in chapter one when he was writing in the diary. And he mentioned how, you know, they could come at any time without warning. Next thing you know, you're vanished, you're vaporized. And everything, they're paying attention to everything, your relationships, actions, expressions remember face crime you can get charged for like looking anxious or weary and vaporizations happen for future crimes this is the interesting thing is there's no laws in oceania so you, you like you can't break anything you're no, you're not breaking laws there in oceania there is no law thoughts and actions which when detected mean certain death are not formally forbidden and are not inflicted as punishment for crimes which have actually been committed, but are merely the wiping out of persons who might perhaps commit a crime. Which reminds me of, uh, there's a movie, Minority Report, and I think in that movie, Tom Cruise is being chased by police because they th- they see that he will commit a crime in the future. <sighs> Crazy, man. Expectations. So what are the expectations? Continuous frenzy of hatred towards foreign enemies, 
no private emotions, no respites from enthusiasm. I meant to look up what respite meant, but no respites from enthusiasm. I can only imagine this means that there is no enthusiasm. Nobody's like really happy. Like think about that, like throughout the first two chapters. I mean, yes, when Julia is with Winston in private, yes, the proles are happy. There's that singing prole outside his window, um, outside the Sherrington shop. But the party members, eh, not really. No emotions whatsoever. And there is just this continuous frenzy of you got to work and you got to fear the enemies, the people that we are at war with. You got to continuously work so we can fund these words to protect Oceania. And they have deliberately put something into place. It's a new speak word, I believe, called crime stop. Yeah, new speak words, crime stop. So crime stop is where you stop short as if by instinct at the threshold of any dangerous thought, like love, maybe. So it is instinctually input, I'm guessing at a young age of party members, that anytime they get these thoughts, happiness, being in a relationship, peace, um, two plus two equals four, you stop directly short of that. It's ingrained in you to know that, hey, this is not right. It's a protective stupidity. It keeps you from asking questions. And yes, it is taught at a very young age. Just like they teach uh, the young kids in Oceania about how like sex and relationships between men and women are like, you shouldn't do that. That's like a weird thing. Meanwhile, the proles are having all the sex in the world. But yeah, you, as a party member, no, no, sex is bad. Like you shouldn't take part in that unless it's for producing babies for the party. So th they do, th Goldstein touches on the necessary alteration of the past. And I had a hunch, I think I wrote a blog post on this, on why this happens. And it's, Goldstein mentions it as tolerating present conditions with no standard to compare it to. So, when you alter the past, when people have trouble remembering the past, their present conditions have no comparison. So their shitty present conditions are not really shitty because what are you comparing that to? It's like a question I always ask. It's like, oh, I, um, like you play, oh, I played horrible today. Well, compared to what? Oh, uh, good point. Compared to last game. See, now you have a comparison. Last game, I scored 15 points. This game, I scored 10. But then maybe, and then this gets into other things too, but you see what I'm saying? There's no comparison here. That's why the pass is constantly alterated. And you're also safeguarding the infallibility of the party. Again, the party is the source of truth. So whatever they say happens in the past, happened in the past. So this is why there's this constant alteration and rectifying of the past. It's the central tenet of Ingsoc. Past is mutable. Whoever, oh, what's the saying? Whoever controls, they said it in the book, whoever controls the past controls the present, and whoever controls the present controls the future. Some, I think it was something like that. Double think. Double think is uh, another huge principle of Ingsoc. And it's basically holding two contradictory thoughts. Conscious deceptions, deceptions with complete honesty. And this is how the party alters history. Because people hold the simultaneous thought of, hey, something is different, but Big Brother says it's not different, so everything's okay. Right? It's acknowledging the fact that the past... Something got changed about the past, and also that something is what Big Brother said, and Big Brother's always right. So it ends up being like a moot point. That's the whole like point of double think. It, like, what truths are there when you can have two contradictory thoughts like exist at the same time? 
and it's mentioned, Goldstein mentions here, those who have the best knowledge of the world are also those who are the furthest from seeing the world as it is. The inner party and its love of war, they are so ingrained in how to do it and what they need to do, the whole process of war that they're so entwined into it that they can't look outside the box. So they are so entwined in the party, Ingsoc, Doublethink, this whole state of warfare and propaganda of Oceania that they actually can't see it for what it really is, which is curious that Winston kind of can. How does Winston get to that point? How does anybody get to that point without having that frame of reference maybe of what times were like before the revolution? I don't know. So next we come to like the very last few pages here. Let's see. Winston's getting to the very end here. And he's reading about the motive. So Goldstein writes, but there is one question which until this moment we have almost ignored. It is why. Why should human equality be averted? Supposing that the mechanics of the process have been rightly described, what is the motive for this huge, accurately planned effort to freeze history at a particular moment of time? Here we reach the central secret, as we have seen the mystique of the party depends on doublethink, but the original motive is still deeper, and he's about to get to this motive and keep reading, and then he stops reading. He notices that Julia has fallen fast asleep. So he kind of takes a pause here. And this is where we're going to end. He starts to reflect now, like, oh my gosh, there's this ultimate secret. He understands how they're doing all this, right? He's kind of a part of it with his work at the Ministry of Truth, but he doesn't understand why they're doing it. And I... He's kind of getting to it, the why, on how the infallibility of the party and to not have any standard to compare your current terrible situation to. So that might factor into the why. But this is where he's kind of chewing on this as uh, part nine ends here. He fell asleep murmuring, sanity is not statistical, with the feeling that this remark contained it a profound wisdom. Sanity is not statistical. You can't measure it. I think that's kind of what he means by that. You know, it's it's just, it's not a statistic. It's just ever present and it's truth. It just exists. Sanity, you can't really measure it. It's not a statistic. And guys, thank you very much for listening this far. That's going to do it for part nine. Uh, we are have, we are at the end of Chapter 2. We have Chapter 2, Part 10 for next time. That's going to wrap up Chapter 2. And then we are close. We're getting closer on the book. We're like more than two-thirds done. I got to say, guys, Chapter 2, Part 10, crazy things are about to happen. So tune in next time for... I, I couldn't put the book down. I actually, ever since Chapter 2, Part 10... I've been reading ahead. I cannot put the book down. Lots just Orwell has now ramped everything up in the story. So it's it's crazy what's about to happen next, guys. Tune in next time for that. And I really, really appreciate you guys sticking with me this far. Uh, no blog posts, I, I guess, for this week. I didn't have discussion questions, but we'll make some for Chapter 2, Part 10. How about that? Anyway, guys, that's going to do it. My name is Chris. This has been Cheetash. Take care.